the happy jug is, uh, as far as I'm aware, kind of like post-human drama, influenced by like uh, things like speculative realism and object-oriented ontology, and it's kind of like talking about it, uh, Nathan's relationship with um, certain traumas that have happened in his life, and in general that are in relation to this happy jug which broke. Yeah, so I've been making the soundtrack for it, so not you know, not 100% music, not 100% kind of like just finding like sound effects, but it's all kind of like trying to get them to like intermingle uh, as well as like, you know, trying to like, I guess sort of throw my own sort of spin on it because um, like I do a lot of music that's like based on kind of like granular synthesis and resampling. So, um, so it's a lot of kind of like very, like very heavily textu textual uh, reworkings of like sound basically. Um, and it kind of like goes from being kind of like pure noise to something that's like quite melancholic. What you're seeing is the limitlessness of that which limits you. My kind of like work as like Kepler for the past year has been really influenced by, um, I guess, kind of like philosophical and kind of aesthetic ideas. And uh, myself and Nathan, uh, probably from from the you know the, the early sort of like um, syndrome. Um, performances as well as you know the fact that we just like you know we have a general interest together about um, you know like theory really and um, and it just felt like you know it's obviously a natural fit for, for this because we've done like you know very uh, very similar research on our own and arrived at like quite, a, quite an interesting kind of like uh, destination. I make sculpture normally um, obviously this is very different. Normally I work quite finely and um, the, the finished product is something that is without any kind of other interaction with anything else. There's three sculptures and I wanted, them, wanted there to be a dialogue between them somehow but still have their kind of identity as, as, as um, individual works. Some of them were more, a little bit more geared to the kind of more political themes. For one of them um, I was looking at footage of, of operations and um, of inside of the brain and camera shots of inside the brain and that's the one on the left side which has kind of these kind of quite kind of um, like tumorous forms on them, the plaster piece. A lot of it was to do with degradation so kind of and, and these old, the, I wanted to create these, these works that kind of felt looming yeah. like the, and with this history to them at the same time yeah. um, and, and also almost yeah. ritualistic um, and I mean, I was thinking about my kind of my experience, like um, of how I experienced the general election, and it was this kind of like that I felt mm. revolted inside, and so I wanted to create mm. something that was kind of quite commanding. So these works that you that that had focus, that also looked they, like they were kind of partially falling apart. I created CGI animations of the Happy Jug, which has a, an object is one of the central motifs. This fluid transparent head has a viscous and climatic human trace that dissipates and reveals this 3D model of the happy jug. And that echoes that as a post-human play, the sculptures or objects are the play's performers. It's against this background of luminous screens or monitors, which is this media sphere that we are surrounded by or enmeshed in. Well, Wherever the virtual camera moves, there's no parallax with this background, so it creates this ontological confusion and shows how embedded we are in this sort of invisible media sphere environment. Well, CGI is a really useful toolkit for showing interobjectivity, and you know, in a typical viewport and dimensional face spaces. I didn't know what I was 
um, what I should expect when I came and I think I was quite taken back by the first few minutes and I didn't, wasn't sure if I was going to enjoy it, I wasn't sure if I was going to feel comfortable um, and once the story progressed and once I started to um, hear a bit more and see a bit more I, I found it really intriguing and really interesting and I wanted to continue and hear what was going to happen even though I knew what was going to happen because I know the couple involved so mm. I found that really interesting. Uh, kind of quite surreal in the references that you that you mentioned about um, how Nathan would describe the play it was quite um, kind of I don't know captured a time which is quite important for, for, for us um, for everyone here I guess about the election and how things were changing and I guess how he was feeling at the time in relation to all of that. That I probably took away from that was that there were times when I found the language that Nathan was using really beautiful and I think there were parts of it when, that I really wanted to hear and was struggling to hear and because of the sound and because of the projections you're sort of, things are, are pushed at you that may be uh, distracting your attention and it made me think about the situation that they were probably in and the story that he was trying to tell and that actually the narrative isn't that clear and um, it sort of made me think of the muddled nature of the family situation and what they were going through and I thought that was quite interesting. Um, it was really brilliant, um, it was really really intense, I thought it was really intense um, and like totally kept me there like the whole way through. Like described as a play and it is a play and it's got a script but then it's done in a really different style isn't it and I was like ah oh. I couldn't quite place what it was, do you know what I mean? But that, I think that's a good thing. I think it's like, I couldn't, yeah. Um, and so I think it was like a lot of different things put together, but actually like there weren't, there weren't actors there in it, but there was like a real presence of people, obviously, with, um, with the voices. I found it really affecting and you know, really quite powerful. And I was quite surprised initially when I saw the stones, I didn't think I'd necessarily engage with um, the setup. But actually the narrative was really, really was engaging and I um, found it quite absorbing. Um, and obviously I think the, the medical narrative bits were the, perhaps the most powerful. There was a moment where you think I'm, I'm uh, listening to Stones talking, which is kind of, kind of bizarre. Um, but then actually you want to hear more about the Stones and also you want to hear more about the personal narrative. And it, particularly the moments where um, we were hearing about the waiting for the operation whilst the operation was happening and kind of engaging with the kind of um, the status of that. I think that the form of the piece um, really spoke to the status of that moment of waiting to hear if someone you love um, is surviving a serious operation. I think Syndrome has been a very ambitious project for Liverpool. Um, it's taking on very contemporary ideas in philosophy and seeing how they manifest in um, creative practice. The piece that I saw would be really successful because it's really ambitious and I think that in itself should be celebrated so the fact that it was um, taking on a lot of contemporary ideas, contemporary um, philosophy that is still kind of at the edges of kind of contemporary thought and seeing some of that worked out in um, a warehouse in Liverpool I think is an exciting thing. I guess what's been exciting about it is really collaborating um, you know from start to finish it was the group of us creating the whole thing yeah. it wasn't just one person would come up with one thing then other people go out and do stuff around that it was genuine collaboration that was really good really it builds on a lot of themes from the whole syndrome program you know there's lots of uses of technology I guess a lot of the syndrome events have kind of spoken word or poetry things and but also experimental music experimental electronica and projections the happy joke was uh, an attempt to make a play that was not totally human centric and worked with objects and phenomena um, as kind of motifs and like the relationship between those motifs um, and between objects being the sort of the thrust of it really. So we used sculptures rather than people uh, to perform the pieces and try to sort of I suppose like blend uh, some of the stuff that we've learned throughout Syndrome about how light can animate objects and surfaces 
um, to kind of bring that to the fore as a dramatic tool. Well, what's interesting for me about the idea of post-human thought is not the idea of there being no humans, it's about a crisis in the human-centricness of things. So, yeah, it's, it's like a sort of emotional piece, right, but there is uh, the potential of connections between things that are not based on how humans perceive them. Hopefully the play picks up on that and uh, rather than being humanist, it's kind of thingist and it's not about kind of like reducing the human, it's about sort of contextualising the human among other things that happen and among those being um, things that are bigger than the human such as uh, environments, things like that, countries. I'm re really excited about um, the play moving beyond the context of syndrome, which itself has been a really interesting project to work on, and like we're really proud of it. Um, uh, and this has very much kind of evolved from that kind of lab experience of syndrome. I'm really interested into how it could evolve into a fully fledged piece of its own that exists maybe outside of the idea of something being experimental. I'm really proud to have like built an audience around uh, experimental new media performance which you know we have none of in Liverpool apart from Syndrome.